evening. My name is Whitney Carr. I'm the Adult Services Manager at Bexley Public Library, and I want to welcome you to our program tonight with Doug Tallamy. Uh, this is a wonderful way to start the Love Your Alley events in our community this year. So in terms of how this program will work, uh, Doug will present, and then we'll have a Q&A afterwards. So please type your question in the Zoom chat at any time during the presentation, and we'll relay the questions to Doug at the end. Um, so this program is also being recorded, and it'll be accessible on the Bexley Public Library YouTube page. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Rebecca Ness, the Vice Chair of Bexley's Environmental Sustainability Advisory Committee to introduce Doug and to tell you more about Love Your Alley, an initiative she spearheaded. So Rebecca and her family have been working on living sustainably for several years, and she's also an acupuncturist and Chinese herbalist and owner of Monarch Acupuncture and Herbs on Main Street. She moved to Bexley from San Francisco in 2017. So thank you again, Rebecca, for all of your hard work coordinating Love Your Alley and Bexley, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Whitney, and thank you everybody for being here tonight. Welcome to the very first day of Love Your Alley. This is um, our second year of Love Your Alley. Last year we planted 850 native plants, and this year we're on track to plant 1,000 more. Love Your Alley is about collaboration, sustainability, creativity, and beauty. It's transforming our underutilized alleys and yards into spaces filled with native plants, supporting our pollinators and restoring biodiversity. We will have some variations on last year's event. Uh, with the awesome new tree lawn ordinance that passed along for plants, we now have a category for best native plant tree lawn. Another addition is we will have a Love Your Alley Festival on Saturday, May 14th. This is the day to come and pick up lots of free native plants, enjoy kids activities, including a, a pet -a bee where people can develop their relationships with bees and learn about plants and beneficial insects. We also now have a Facebook page for Love Your Alley for lots of information so you don't miss anything and inspiration. We've also formed partnerships with the Bexley Public Library and the Drexel Theater with events at both these venues. Thank you so much to the Bexley Public Library for hosting this event tonight. If you don't live in a house with an alley, there are still many ways to get involved. You can go native in your tree lawn or your yard. You can help plan and organize. You can join a, you can join a plant installation team or transition to a pollinator lawn, grow native seedlings and distribute to neighbors. Uh, regardless of the featured alley and winning blocks that happen during Love Your Alley, everyone that participates this year will support our pollinators and make our public spaces more beautiful and more enjoyable. I want to tell you about a couple of other events that are happening this month on May 4th. We have using, this one is also at the Bexley Public Library, May 4th at seven o'clock. It's in public or via Zoom. It's using native plants in nooks and crannies with Deborah Kanapke. This, this talk is really aimed at helping people to landscape in small spaces, um, which is what a lot of our alley spaces are. And then on May 11th, we have Hometown Habitat film screen, screening at the Drexel Theater with Q&A afterwards with the producer and director, Catherine Zimmerman. Um, let's see, all, it, for the rest of the information, you can visit bexley.org slash loveyouralley. You can find out all the information you need to register, how you can volunteer, um, how you can enter for judging and peruse all the events. And thank you to the Bexley Community Foundation for their generous grant funding this initiative. So doc, Dr. Doug Tallamy is the TA Baker Professor of Agriculture in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, where he, where he has authored 104 research publications and has taught insect-related courses for 40 years. Chief among his research goals is to better understand the many ways insects interact with plants and how such interactions determine the diversity of animal communities. His book, Bringing Nature Home, was published by Timber Press in 2007 and was awarded the 2008 Silver Medal by the Garden Writers Association. The Living Landscape, co-authored by Rick Dark, was published in 2014. Nature's Best Hope, a New York Times bestseller, was released in February 2020, and his latest book, The Nature of Oaks, was released by Timber Press in March 2021. Among his awards are the Garden Club of America Mar Margaret Douglas Medal for Conservation and the Tom Dodd Junior Award of Excellence. The 2018 AHS 
by Morrison Communication Award and the 2019 Cynthia Westcott Scientific Writing Award. Dr. Tallamy and Homegrown National Park, a nationwide grassroots call to action to restore biodiversity is also the inspiration for both Love Your Alley and our 2022 Mosquito Pilot Program. Thank you, Dr. Tallamy, for your inspiration and thank you for being here with us tonight. Well, thanks very much, Rebecca. Peta B, I love it. You have to tell <laughs> me how that turns out. <laughs> I will. Okay, we're gonna talk about Nature's Best Hope, my idea of Nature's Best Hope, but before we do that, let's talk about E.O. Wilson's idea of Nature's Best Hope. Um, you know, he died the day after Christmas, uh, Professor Emeritus at, at Harvard, extremely long and, and you know, one of the most productive career, careers ever. I could give a whole talk about, about Edward O. Wilson's work. But in 2016, he wrote a book called Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life. And this was the culmination of his, his career's effort to save life on, on planet Earth. He loved biodiversity. He knew that we needed it. Uh, and he said, if we're going to save life anywhere, we need to save functioning ecosystems. We need to save nature on half of the planet or it's going to disappear everywhere. And he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that statement. Uh, and then the end of the book, he didn't spend a lot of time talking about how we could actually do that. Um, of course, that's a, it's a great idea uh, to save half of planet Earth. Back here. I'm going backwards. All right, sorry. Um, but even conservation biologists are, are wondering how we could, how we could actually do this. Uh, half of planet Earth is already in some form of agriculture. And we've got almost 8 billion people. It might be 8 billion people by today, I don't know. In the other half, along with all of our airports and roads and detritus. And we don't have a third half that we could put aside for, for nature. So how, how can we do this? Well, I, I actually think we can do it. That's what I wanna talk about tonight. I think we can realize EO's dream, but we need a new approach to conservation to do it. But before we talk about that new approach, let's talk about uh, an oak mast that occurred, at least on the East Coast. I'm pretty sure Ohio was involved in 2019, uh, where all the members of the Red Oak Group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time. And this is what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained. So I took one of those acorns and I just stared at it. And I was rewarded because an insect started to chew its way out of the acorn. First, it chewed a little hole for its head. Then it forced its head through there. Then it forced its entire body through that hole. It was a tight squeeze, looked like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Finally, it plopped down, and that's a dangerous time for that insect larva, because a lot of things want to eat it. So it gets to safety by wiggling and squirming beneath the soil surface. And once it's underground, it stretches in all directions and forms a chamber. And within that chamber, it converts itself to a pupa. And then surprisingly, stays there for two years. After two years, comes out as an acorn weevil. That's what an acorn weevil looks like. They have a Looks like they have big noses, but that's actually an extension of the head capsule. And their mouth parts are way down here at the end of that extension. And they take those mouth parts, chew a hole into the center of the acorn, turn around and lay an egg in that hole. And that's how the larva gets down there. You might wonder why they spend two years underground. Why don't they come out the next year like most insects would? And the answer is it takes red oak acorns 18 months to complete their development. So if they came out the next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for them. Of course, after they leave the acorn, it leaves a hole, a true vacuum. Uh, and you know that nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she has filled it with three species of temnothorax ants, tiny little ants where the entire colony lives in the holes made by acorn weevils after they have left acorns. And if scouts find a new hole, a new acorn with a new hole, they get all excited because their old acorns falling apart. So they tell everybody it is time to move. They grab the larvae, they grab the eggs, they move the entire colony into the new acorn in about 30 minutes. They post a guard there, make sure nobody else comes in. And that's where they'll live for the next two years until this acorn falls apart. So what's my point? Uh, it's very simple. That is just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions between animals and plants that comprise the bulk of nature. This is another one, the relationship between jays and acorns. Jays are the primary disperser of, of oak acorns. They'll take an acorn from the tree and they'll fly up to a mile from the parent tree, tap it below the surface of the soil. Uh, and the object is they're gonna go back in the winter time and have something to eat. But uh, for every four acorns they bury, they only remember where one is. So for every four acorns they bury, they've actually planted three 
oak trees. Specialized interaction between pileated woodpeckers and carpenter ants. That's what they rear their young on, carpenter ants. So you won't have a lot of pileated woodpeckers unless you have a lot of carpenter ants, and you won't have a lot of carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena faciliae, unless you have facilia. That is the only pollen, the only plant that that bee can rear its young on. And it turns out that pollen specialization is very common in our native bees. We have almost 4,000 species of native bees, and almost a third of them, actually a little more than a third of them, are highly specialized. They can only reproduce on the pollen of particular plants. You won't have the Baltimore checker spot unless you have white turtle head. I could talk all night, all week, all year about nature specialized relationships. The point I wanna make though, is that these relationships, nature itself is now on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we didn't take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. <clears throat> Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, looked out over the edge and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Well, we didn't leave it as it was. Uh, there's there's uh, only about 5% of the lower 48 states. It's anything close to its original pristine ecological condition. Uh, and that's because we have, we have logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it. We have drained it. We have grazed it. We've got 770 million acres of rangeland in this country. That's four and a half times the size of Texas dedicated to cows. And of course we've paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them and you can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we've carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated to sustain the amount of nature we need them to sustain to run the ecosystems that we all depend on. Why have we done this? I don't know, but I suspect that we thought the earth, our nest was so, so large that we could foul it forever. And for a long time, it, it really was, but now there's so many of us, that's just not true uh, anymore. Um, there are serious consequences to us fouling our, our nest. And that's why we're seeing headlines like this, pretty scary headlines, like the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Talking about global insect decline. Followed by this one, North America has lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. That's, that's almost a third of our North American bird population already gone. And now the UN says we're gonna lose a million species to extinction probably in the next 20 years. I don't know if you remember, but a couple months ago, we removed 23 species from the endangered species list, not because we've saved them, but because they're already extinct. So this is happening, but um, we can't allow it to happen. We depend on these species. This is not an option. So I can go on talking about the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment, that's upon all of our houses, but that's not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from a lot of people, those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return briefly to this headline, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Well, back to uh, E.O. Wilson. He told us what it would mean if insects, if, if uh, earth was to lose its insects. And he did it way back in 1987 with this paper, the little things that run the world. And again, his message was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappeared, that would so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial habitats that the food webs that support our animals, our reptiles, our amphibians, our birds, our mammals, even our freshwater fishes, those food webs would collapse and those animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that rapidly uh, turn over nutrients and all we would have is bacteria and fungi. And humans wouldn't survive any of those, those drastic changes. There is some good news here though, and, and that is that none of that has to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself, but we're going to have to change the way we landscape in order to do it. Why is that? Well, remember humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on the life support that ecosystems provide us. We call them ecosystem services. Here are just a few things that plants do that we depend on, like produce oxygen, like clean our water, 
slow its journey to the sea where it becomes too salty to use. Like capturing carbon, pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, out of harm's way, uh, building their tissues out of that carbon, but then pumping the extra carbon into the ground where it can remain stable for thousands of years. Plants also build topsoil and hold it in place. They prevent floods, they dampen severe weather, they convert sunlight into food. If we lose our plants, we're gonna to have to eat sunlight and that'll be, that'll be hard. What do animals do for plants? They provide pest control services. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds. So designing landscapes like this uh, is that destroy the production of ecosystem services is just not a good idea. Never was a good idea, but today it's an absolutely terrible idea because we've got so many people demanding those services. Again, almost eight, 8 billion of us. Now we do have parks, we do have preserves and they're doing the best they can, but it's not enough. And that's why we are now in the sixth great extinction that the planet has ever experienced, which means we're going to have to practice conservation outside of parks and preserves on landscapes just like this. There have been visionaries through the ages who have recognized that we humans needed to work on a piece of work on our relationship with planet Earth. And uh, he wrote extensively in the first half of the 1900s. One of the things he said is the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. And there have been indigenous groups that have been able to do that for a while. But our huge Western societies and our huge uh, Asian societies are terrible at doing that. We habitually take more from the earth than it has to offer, completely wrecking an area, then going to another uh, place doing the same thing. Not sustainable behavior. But uh, Leopold had a lot of faith in humans. He believed we could develop what he called a land ethic. He knew we had to use the land. We had to farm and lumber and graze and do all those things. But he believed we could learn to do them gently enough that we did not destroy local ecosystems. That's what he called the land ethic. He wrote about it in the Sand County Almanac, his most famous book. What he did not write about, though, was developing a land ethic where we actually lived. And I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist in the same place at the same time. The notion was so deeply embedded in the culture of Aldo Leopold's day, still embedded in our own culture, that he may not have recognized it as an option. What I wanna argue this evening though, is that not only is living with nature an option, it is the only viable option that's now left to us. In the past, of course, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head and we need to practice conservation where there are a lot of people because that's pretty much everywhere. In other words, we have to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes, not hang on by a thread, but thrive. Where are we gonna start? Well, let's go back to private property. We can't ignore private property. If we don't practice conservation on private property, we're going to fail. And that's because most of the land is privately owned. 85.6% of the US east of the Mississippi is privately owned. 95% of Texas is privately owned. 92% of Maine is privately owned. 78% of the entire country is privately owned. We absolutely have to use private property for conservation or we will fail. Now when you use the word conservation, I'm, I'm not being accurate. We do wanna conserve any parts of nature that are left, absolutely, but we need to now focus on restoring nature where we've, we've torn it asunder. Uh, and and you know, before you tell me that we can't put it back together again exactly the way it was, um, I understand that. But if we reunite enough of those specialized interactions that I opened the talk with, we can create functional ecosystems again, uh, even if it's not exactly what was in those places four, five, six, seven hundred years ago. But there are, are uh, some groups that contribute a lot more to ecosystem function than others. So we have to start with those building blocks and we can add the other species later on. And there are two groups that we can't do without. One of them is the flowering plants and the pollinators that allow those plants to reproduce. They, of course, are capturing energy from the sun and through photosynthesis, uh, turning it into food. That's the food that supports all the life on terrestrial earth. And then they store that food in their plant parts. So now we have uh, all the food stored in, in plants, mostly leaves. Well, most vertebrates don't eat plants directly. They eat invertebrates that ate plants. And most of those invertebrates are insects and not just any insect. It turns out that caterpillars 
are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we develop, if we design landscapes that don't have a lot of caterpillars in them, we will have failed food webs and eventually failed ecosystems. I'm gonna use the Carolina chickadee as an example. Uh, I believe in, in Ohio, you've got the black cat chickadee. They're practically the same bird doing the same thing. They're the birds at our feeders all winter long uh, eating seeds. And we tend to think that's all chickadees need. Well, 50% of their diet in the wintertime is seeds. The other 50% is insects and spiders, even in the wintertime. And then when they reproduce, their babies can't eat seeds at all. Uh, so they abandon seeds uh, and they switch to insects and not just any insects. If they're in a healthy environment, they will rear their young exclusively on caterpillars. Uh, and they are not exceptions. 96% of our terrestrial birds rear their young on insects. And most of those insects are caterpillars. So um, how do I know that? There's a number of lines of evidence that suggest that, but this is a citizen science project that one of my grad students did a few years ago, Ashley Kennedy. She put out a call for uh, bird photographers to take pictures of birds during the breeding season when they were carrying food to the nest in their beaks and send those pictures to Ashley. She's gonna identify what the prey items were in the beaks of the birds and reconstruct the nestling diet for as many species of birds in North America as she could. Uh, and you're looking at a, a summary of her results. She got thousands of pictures, so it was very successful. This is the uh, 20 most common bird families. The green bars are the percentage of those bird families nestling diets that were caterpillars. And in 16 out of the 20 common bird families, caterpillars dominated the diet. So again, if we design landscapes that don't have enough caterpillars, most of our birds are not gonna be able to reproduce successfully. Sounds like something special about caterpillars. What is it? Well, there's actually several things special about caterpillars. And one of them is that they're soft. Think of this guy as if he's a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. The thin wrapper is exoskeleton, it's cuticle, it's made of chitin, it's undigestible, and the birds don't want a lot of that. And because they're soft, you can stuff those caterpillars down the throat of your offspring without fear of injuring them. And if you've ever watched a parent bird rear their young, they're, they're pretty rough. Your beak is like a plunger, they just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Many of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but do you wanna chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? They're nutritious, they're very high in fat, very high in protein, low percentage of chitin compared to many other insects, particularly uh, beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages, they're like little tanks. And many beetles have very sharp edges too. And finally, it turns out the caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now I mentioned carotenoids, not because I love organic chemistry, uh, but because I'm a, I'm a vertebrate and you're a vertebrate and birds are vertebrates and we vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids. So we have to get our carotenoids from plants and we have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. Where are the birds getting their carotenoids from? From what they are bringing to the nest, of course. Uh, but look, carotenoid content is not equal, not equally distributed through bird prey items. These first two bars here are types of caterpillars. Uh, they have far more carotenoids than other, other types of bird prey. Here are the adult caterpillars down here, the moths and butterflies themselves, far fewer carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves. The carotenoids are in the green leaves. And here's the earthworm way down here. So the other bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. So that study and several others are suggesting that caterpillars are not optional parts of bird diets. They are essential parts of bird diets. So let's just say birds need caterpillars. Okay, the next question is how many caterpillars do they need? Is one or two enough or one or two a day enough? Well, that's a good question. Let's go back to, cat, uh, to uh, chickadees because we got a lot of data on chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of chickadees? One or two is not enough. One or two a day is not enough. It takes thousands. Depending on the number of chicks in the nest, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars just to get them to the point where they fledge, where they leave the nest. And after they fledge, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days. So you're really talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars necessary to make a bird that's a third of an ounce. That's four pennies worth of bird. And if you want chickadees to breed in your yard, and I should think you, you would want that because in so many places, that's all we have. You have to have all those caterpillars in your yard because chickadees only forage about 50 meters from the nest. They are, they are not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. 
And if we landscape in a way that does not create all of those insects, all of those caterpillars, that's called insect decline. And it's really looking like insect decline is one of the major causes of bird declines. We went to the original data set of Rosenberg et al. That's the Smithsonian group that said we've lost 3 billion birds in the last uh, 50 years. And we divided the terrestrial bird species into two groups, the species that need insects and the species that don't. So species like uh, doves and finches can actually reproduce on seeds. They can make a little milk out of it and that's what they feed their young. And look, they didn't lose any numbers at all in the last 50 years, but the species that require insects, particularly when they're breeding, uh, on average lost 10 million individuals per species. So this doesn't prove cause and effect, but it certainly does suggest that as you take insects, as you take bird food away, you, you lose birds. It's not rocket science. So in an abundance of caution, we need to add a, a new goal to our landscaping goals. In the past, we've had one goal, and that is to make pretty landscapes. Uh, and, and we don't have to give that up, but now we need to make pretty landscapes that are also ecologically productive that are, are housing lots of insects, including those caterpillars. So how do we add caterpillars to landscapes? Uh, it's actually pretty easy. You simply put the plants that support those caterpillars in your landscape. There is a catch though, and that is that most plants don't support a lot of caterpillars. So we have to be fussy about it. We have to choose the plants that do. And we have to be fussy about it because the caterpillars themselves are fussy about it. And the monarch butterfly illustrates that perfectly. You can have all the calorie pear, all of the burning bush, all the barberry, all of the ginkgos, all of the camellias, all of the hostas, all of the things we typically landscape with. Most of those plants are from Asia in our yards and you won't have a single monarch butterfly. The only thing that's gonna make a monarch butterfly is one of the milkweed species. That's called host plant specialization. And it turns out that most insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. Why? because the plants have made them specialize. Plants don't wanna be eaten. They wanna capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense. It keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there. It's not because there's no insects out there that wanna eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well defended. But insects do eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. Every plant lineage that is out there protects itself with a unique cocktail of chemical defenses. And, and the thing, in one insect species cannot adapt to all of them. So they pick one or two plant lineages that are really similar in how they protect themselves. And they develop the specialized adaptations that allow them to circumvent those, those uh, defenses, to get around them. They develop specialized enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, specialized behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize their exposure to those compounds. It takes a long period of evolutionary history with those, all those plants for uh, those adaptations to fall into place. But once they do, the insect is locked into eating those particular plants. So if you take the milkweeds out of your yard and replace it with hostas, the monarch's not gonna be able to develop on hostas. The monarch has two choices then. It's going to uh, fly away and find milkweed someplace else, or it's going to starve to death. And this is why when we bring in plants from other continents and we landscape everywhere with them, and when they escape into our natural areas and become serious invasive species displacing our native plants, this is why our, our uh, food webs are collapsing and our insects are declining. So all I'm trying to say here is that there are three types of plants, contributors, non-contributors, and detractors. Contributors are species that actually uh, contribute some of the energy they captured from the sun to local food webs. And that's why we have other, other uh, animals around. I pictured an oak here because nothing contributes better than, than oaks. A non-contributor would be something like a ginkgo. It's a pretty tree, uh, it's not invasive, but it, it's just there. It doesn't make a single caterpillar, doesn't contribute to the food web at all. And oh, so it reminds me of a, a, a statue um, you can you can admire it, but how many statues do you, do you want? A detractor is, of course, a plant that uh, 
not only doesn't produce any food, but then it escapes where we plant it and becomes a serious invasive species in our natural areas. Things like calorie pear that, you know, can, this, this is a land conservancy uh, property here that is thoroughly invaded with, with calorie pear. I mean, you know this, we all know what a serious invasive species is. And it's just one of, of you know, hundreds of invasive plants that we have brought in. So again, plant choice matters. If we don't pick the right, right plants, uh, we're not gonna be able to reconstruct functional food webs and our restoration will not be successful. And I'm gonna give you three examples of how easily it can be successful when we do use the right plants. I'm gonna start with, with uh, our house right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. This is where my wife, Cindy and I moved in the year 2000. We got uh, 10 acres on a farm that was uh, broken up into 10 acre lots. It had been mowed for hay, very old farm, been farmed for 300 years, very few plants there at all. So our goal was to restore the ecosystem here on, on this little piece of planet Earth. Uh, and in order to do that, we knew we had to bring the caterpillars back. So I'll give you some examples. Uh, I wanted to see if we could get the Canadian outlet to make a living at our house. Um, that's what the Canadian outlet looked like. I'd never even seen a Canadian outlet. That's what the adult looks like, just like a leaf. Well, you're not going to have Canadian outlets unless you have Meadow Row, host plant specialist on Meadow Row. And we didn't have any Meadow Row. There used to be Meadow Row here hundreds of years ago, I am sure. Uh, but with, with, you know, the entire area was farmed to death. No Meadow Row at, at all. So I got some Meadow Row seeds from someplace and planted them and they grew very nicely. But this was early on and I, uh, I actually had very little faith that any. Uh, Canadian Alice would be able to find my meadow row, at least not find it quickly. So I didn't go out and check the meadow row for at least two months after I planted it. Uh, but then I walked by for another reason one day and turned around and looked at it and it was covered with Canadian Alice. So um, they had found it right away. I'm still surprised about that. Uh, so it was a big success. Now we have a good population of meadow row and Canadian Alice. We have added two species to the, to the property. The restoration is underway. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. That's a misnomer. This beautiful moth has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's a specialist on this plant, Biden's aristosa. We didn't have any Biden's aristosa, but I did know where there were some Biden's in a power line cut about 14 miles away. So I went and got some Biden seeds, planted them at home. They grew very nicely. Took a year for the goldenrod stowaway to find my Biden's, but it finally did. And now we have a good population of both of those. So now we've added four species to the property. Wanted the Hackberry Emperor, not because it's the most beautiful butterfly, but because it belongs here. It's one of the species that should be here. But as its name suggests, it's a specialist on Hackberry, on Celtus. We didn't have any Hackberry. So we planted Hackberry. Uh, I had to wait four years for the Hackberry Emperor to, to find my Hackberry, but they, they did. And last June, I, I checked one of my Hackberry branches and there were nine Hackberry Emperor caterpillars on a single branch. So another big success. Now we've added six species to the property. And that's how it went. I did not plant goldenrod, it came in on its own. And along with it came many of the species that depend on goldenrod, like the brown hooded owlet, the arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparaganothus, the goldenrod gall moth. And here's one that hasn't come, the goldenrod flower moth. I don't know why it hasn't come. That's what its caterpillars look like, but it's still part of the fun. It's, it's anticipation. It's like uh, waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. Every year I go out and look for the goldenrod flower moth. One of these days I'm gonna find it and that'll be a great year. Planted Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper. I hear that people don't like Virginia creeper. I just don't know why. It's a great native plant. It's got good fall color. It can climb our trees without girdling them, without pulling them down. It's a good ground cover. It's, it makes very nutritious berries uh, for the birds in the fall. They're very high in fat. It's a good pollinator plant makes small inconspicuous flowers. You don't even notice it's in bloom until you see this big cloud of native bees that's around it. Remember, when you're making a pollinator garden, you're making it for the pollinators. If it's not big and showy for you, that's okay. I planted Virginia creeper because it's the best host plant for the large sphinx moths that are the, the uh, primary component of cardinal diets when they're feeding their young. Things like the Pandora sphinx and its beautiful adult, the lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx, all on Virginia creeper. Uh, planted there, wanted to get the double tooth prominent at our house just because it's such a cool looking caterpillar. I mean, even if you don't like caterpillars, you gotta like this guy. 
It's a specialist on elm, particularly American elm. And of course, we didn't have any American elm. We lost American elms to Dutch elm disease decades ago, but there are still two uh, big American elms at the University of Delaware that make seed every year. And I got uh, seed from those plants, planted them at home 19 years ago. Those trees are now 80 feet tall, another big success. And they brought in the double tooth prominent American elm. Wanted the evening primrose moth because it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else. Well, believe it or not, we didn't have any evening primrose, no, no enothera, so I planted that. The moth came, spends the day with its head stuffed in the flowers, it's very cute. And I planted lots of oaks. Now those are just examples of the plant lineages that I have, uh, that my, my wife and I have added to the, to the property. But I wanna focus on oaks for a while because they are such important plants. This is the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York, Martha Stewart land. Uh, it is, it's enormous. People argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. And I hear, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. And if you can only enjoy your oak when it's 400 years old, you're right. You won't, you won't live long enough. But if you can enjoy what your oak is contributing to your local food web, you can enjoy it right away. And I can say that with confidence because I planted most of my oaks as acorns, which means they were free, or as, as uh, two foot bare root whips which means they cost $1.50 each. And immediately they started to rebuild uh, the food web by calling in moths that then created caterpillars that run that food web. Things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered moth, the uh, Suzuki's promolactus, the red wash caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, uh, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the hesitant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the orange patch smoky wing, the white blotched heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panapoda, the laugher, and literally hundreds more species of moths have come to the oaks on our property and they come right away. This is a pin oak that's just popped its head above the leaves and here's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that plant. Unmute. Good. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, so your oaks start to contribute to, to local food webs immediately. Now, this is what our yard looks like uh, from that position I took the original picture from. And I and, uh, just want to illustrate, uh, we've got a little lawn here. We're very traditional, but I put a lot of plants back. I'm still adding plants. Um, it's a long, long process. But uh, through the years, we have learned through our research how important uh, moth species are to your local food web. So five years ago, I decided to uh, undertake the challenge of counting all the moth species that are now making a living at our house. Uh, I'm still at it. Uh, we do it by taking pictures of them. And so far, I have taken pictures of 1,140 species of, of moths. I haven't gotten to the butterflies yet, but uh, that's a lot of moths. We have 10 acres. Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. So on one 240,000th of the land mass, we have 44% uh, of all the moths that occur in the entire state. And because so many of these species are types of bird food, we've recorded 60 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres. Not flew by, but bred. Why am I telling you this? Well, here's another uh, another statistic that we, we see uh, pretty regularly. World Wildlife Fund says that Earth has lost two thirds of its wildlife since 1970. But I'm thinking not at our house. Uh, I am convinced we have increased biodiversity by more than two thirds uh, and it didn't take that long and it wasn't that hard. All we did was put the plants back, which means you can do the same thing, which means we can turn these terrible statistics around if we all get busy and start putting those plants back. But I know what you're thinking. We have 10 acres. Uh, a lot of people have less land than that. Will it work on smaller properties in suburbia? And that's a good question. So let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri, where they have 0.6 acres, 18 times less land than Cindy and I have. They live in the middle of a, a development. All their neighbors have the big lawns. When they moved in, their yard was choked with, with bush honeysuckle, with Amur honeysuckle, another invasive from China. So the first thing they did was get rid of that. Then they planted 75 species of native plants, put in a water feature, and then sat back and started to count the birds. And they are up to 149 bird species 
uh, that they have recorded at their house, including 35 warbler species. Just to put that in perspective, we've only recorded eight warbler species at our house. So does it work on smaller properties? Absolutely. What about urban yards? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean, in Chicago, she's right next to O'Hare Airport, right next to Kennedy Expressway over here. She's got one tenth of an acre. That is three times smaller than the average lot size. Um, it's a pretty one tenth of an acre, uh, but um, it is completely isolated. She is not connected to any natural area at all. But she did the same thing. She got rid of her, her invasive plants, her non-native plants, put in a water feature, and then she sat back and started to count her birds. And she's up to 124 bird species that have used her yard, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. If you haven't seen a woodcock lately, go to Pam's house. Okay, there are five things we need to, to talk about if we're gonna succeed in a big way, and we need to succeed in a big way. And one of them is to reduce our big lawns. We've got to shrink the area that we have in lawn in this country. As of 2005, we had 40 million acres of lawn, and you know it hasn't shrunk since then. That's an area the size of New England that is dedicated to an ecological deadscape. Uh, and we do that because, because it's a status symbol. So we need our status symbols. We also need area to display our Halloween uh, decorations. But what if we cut the area of lawn in half? What if we took areas like this and we started planting them? So I got this picture from, from Dan Getman in Missouri a couple of months ago. He's doing just that. He had a big lawn. He's putting in a lot of native plants. This is only the second year of his planning. Well, if we do that, if we cut the area in half, that gives us 20 million acres we can put towards, towards restoration. And if we do it at home, we can create a new national park that uh, I am calling Homegrown National Park. And it'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. Add up all these parks, still less than 20 million acres. So Homegrown National Park is gonna be the biggest park in the country. What do we get when we put a park at home? We get the opportunity to develop a personal relationship with mother nature, either renew it if we had one as a child but have lost it or develop it for the first time. All we have to do is go outside or even look out a window. And we can do that at our own time, our own pace. Uh, we can avoid crowds. You know, if you go to a real national park, 375 million people last summer were there with you, uh, which means most of the time you're sitting in a, in a parking lot. It's free. There's no admission fee. Um, it's never closed no matter what pandemic comes down the pike. No travel hassles. You get to experience the natural world alone, which I think is essential if you're going to develop that personal relationship, not mediated by somebody else. Uh, and this is particularly important for our poor kids who are suffering from nature deficit disorder, according to Richard Louvre. So we're trying, we get 30 kids, we put them on a bus, they drive for an hour with a teacher uh, and then they get out and they walk around. The teacher tells them not to touch anything. Then they get back in the bus and they go home. And that's their experience with the natural world, which I'm sure is better than nothing. Uh, but it's really been an experience with 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If they live uh, with some part of nature right in their yard, all they have to do is go outside and get to become friends with it, get to know it on their own terms. No parental supervision. They will come home again. You know, when you hover over your kids, it sends a message that whatever they're doing is dangerous. We don't want them to think that the natural world is dangerous. There's a, you know, there's some, life is not risk-free, but her, your cell phone is more dangerous than, than your yard. I guarantee it. And this is so important because our kids are the future stewards of the world. If they don't realize that, if they don't know how to steward, if they don't love stewarding the natural world, they're gonna be lousy stewards and we can't afford any more lousy stewardship. And maybe they will hunt, learn how to hunt lizards. I'm learning this from my own granddaughter, Zoe, who lives in Hawaii on a very modest patch of nature. It's a piece of lawn with a hedge. Uh, but there are anole lizards there. And when she learned that, she sent me this picture to describe how you hunt lizards. You get in the ground and you cover yourself with leaves and sticks so the lizards can't see you coming. Then you crawl slowly towards the lizard. No smiling. This is serious business. You can wear your best dress. That's okay. But you crawl slowly towards the lizard. You catch the lizard. You put the lizard in an aquarium. You learn how to take care of the lizard. 
you become friends with the living. You fall in love with, with that part of the natural world. Now, I don't think Zoe's going to be crawling on the ground in her best dress the rest of her life catching, catching lizards. I don't think. She sent me this picture not too long ago, so who knows? Look, she's not afraid. She loves it. But I guarantee her experience with lizards in Hawaii is going to help her be a good steward of the planet. She's going to remember that the rest of her life. If you want your kids to do more than catch lizards, get Nancy Strinacy's Nature Play at Home. Dozens of examples of how to expose your kids to the natural world. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, you can do it. Go to our, our uh, website, homegrownnationalpark.org. It is free. Register your property and the amount of area that you're going to be a good steward of. If you're going to cut your lawn in half, how much area is that? If you're protecting a wood lot, um, if you're putting in uh, some, some uh, native trees, whatever you're doing. If you're, if you're restoring those alleys, those areas should go on, on the map. And your little piece of your county is going to light up. Uh, and the object is to get the message that everybody is an important um, feature of the future of conservation, even the people that don't know that. We want that message to go viral throughout the country. You want to see the entire map light up so that we have a visual mess, uh, um, representation of our, our conservation progress. Okay, we're going to shrink the lawn. The second thing we need to do is to put the right plants back in the area that was once in lawn. And some of those have to be what I'm calling keystone plants. Remember what a keystone is? It, remember what a Roman arch is? That's the Roman arch. The keystone is a stone in the middle of the arch. And if you take that stone out of the arch, the arch falls down. Well, if you take keystone plants out of the local food web, the food web collapses because keystone plants are making most of the food. Just 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. So think of the keystone plants in the ecological house that you're building as the two by fours that hold up that house. They're essential. They're the support that's gonna keep that, that ecological house going. You cannot build a house out of wallpaper. And that's what we've been trying to do for the last hundred years. You're not through building your house once you've got your keystone plants there, but uh, they are a necessary part of it. So the question is no longer simply, are, are natives better than non-natives? Um, on average, they certainly are, but there are a number of natives that don't contribute all that much either. So the question really is, do we wanna favor the plants that contribute the most, both to, to pollinators and to caterpillars or not? What plants do contribute the most? Um, well, in 84% of the counties in which they occur, it's one of the oaks. Uh, in the mid-Atlantic states, they support 557 species over 950 species nationwide. There's no other plant genus that comes close to that. And if you wanna find out what the keystone plants are where you live, go to Native Plant Finder and the, the National Wildlife Federation website, put in your zip code and the ranked list of the most important um, woody plant genera and herbaceous plant genera for your county will pop up. Uh, now, these are just abbreviated lists. I stopped because I ran, ran out of room. But uh, a list in Ohio is going to look very similar to this. You're going to have oaks and cherries and willows, uh, birches, blueberries, maples. They will all be on there. These three, uh, goldenrods, the genera that asters were broken up into, and, of course, uh, perennial sunflowers. Not only are they the best in terms of supporting caterpillars, they're also the best in terms of supporting specialist bees. When you are planting a garden for bees, you want to focus on what the specialist bees need. If you only focus on what the generalist bees need, the honeybees and the, hun and the bumblebee, uh, you won't have any specialists. But if you, if you focus on what the specialists need, you will have all the bees because the generalists can use them as well. Those three genera right there are gonna give you at least 44 species of bees that you won't have without them. So we're going to shrink the lawn, we're gonna put in keystone plants, we're gonna invite a lot of, of insects to our yard and then we're gonna kill them with our security light. And of course that is not the goal. There's a lot of research showing that, that light pollution is one of the major causes of insect declines. And these are all the ways that, that lights kill insects, particularly those all important moths that create those all important caterpillars. This is good news to me, believe it or not, because we have got to, we've got to reverse insect declines. We've already lost almost 50% of the insects on the entire planet. They're the things that run the planet. If we can reverse insect declines by flicking a switch, we're getting off easy. That's pretty easy to do. We got a lot of switches to flick, but we can do it. 
but I know what you're going to say. I can't turn the light out over my garage or over my barn or over my, my, uh, my front porch because the bad man will come. All right, put a motion sensor on your light so it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're going to realize is that the bad man doesn't come very often. And if you don't want to do that, take the white bulb out of your security light and put in a yellow bulb. A yellow LED is the best because yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to nocturnal insects than are white, white wavelengths. If you switch out your white bulb for a yellow bulb overnight, we will save millions of insects and millions of dollars if we use LEDs because they're a lot more energy efficient. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna shrink the lawn. We're going to put in keystone plants. We're gonna turn out our lights. Then we're going to uh, hire Mosquito Joe to come kill all of our insects. This is a booming business around the country. Mosquito Joe is, is single-handedly reversing everything I've been working on for the last 20 years. He says it's okay because this is a, a natural product. And, and it is, it's pyrethroids. It's made in, in chrysanthemums. Of course, it's industrial strength pyrethroids, a little bit stronger than what's in the plant. But cyanide is a natural product too. So that's not a good argument. He also says it only kills mosquitoes. And boy, I wish he was right. Uh, he's not. It kills all the insects that it comes in contact with, including monarchs. Two, two falls ago, there were records of hundreds of dead monarchs that flew through Mosquito Joe's fog here. The important thing is it does not control mosquitoes. And that's the goal, remember? You don't control mosquitoes in the adult stage. In order to control them in the adult stage, you've got to, uh, you've got to kill 90% of the mosquitoes, which is almost impossible. Mosquito Joe kills between 10 and 50% of the mosquitoes. So if you're, if, you're, if you're going to control mosquitoes, you want to do it in the larval stage. And you can use mosquito dunks. It's a targeted, very cheap way to do it. Get a bucket, fill it full of water, uh, put in a, a handful of straw or hay, and let it ferment for a couple of days in the sun. It will build up populations of algae and diatoms. Uh, and that is what mosquito larvae eat. So this becomes an irresistible brew to uh, mosquito females that want to lay their eggs. They'll lay their eggs in your bucket. Then you go to the hardware store and you buy a sheet of mosquito dunks, nine bucks. Throw in one of those mosquito dunks. It's Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a, it's a uh, formulation of Bacillus thuringiensis that only kills aquatic diptera. And the only aquatic dipterin in your bucket is uh, a mosquito larva. So it's very targeted. If a dragonfly gets in there, it won't, won't hurt it a bit. The dragonfly will actually eat the mosquito larvae. Uh, if a bird drinks it, uh, no problem. If your dog drinks it, no problem. If your child drinks it, no problem. You might put a coarse screen over your bucket so that uh, if a chipmunk jumps in there, he doesn't, doesn't drown. But um, if everybody did this, we would control mosquitoes uh, with uh, a lot less money and a lot more effectively without killing everything else. Okay, the fourth thing we need to do is to landscape in a way that allows caterpillars to complete their development. What do I mean by that? Well, this is an example. I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. The caterpillar eats the leaves, then it spins a cocoon and hangs from one of the branches. Then it emerges as an adult. Then it does it all over again. I wish everything did that, but most species don't. Most species finish growing as, as caterpillars on the tree and then they drop from the tree and they try to wiggle their way underground when the ground is soft enough to do that, to pupate underground or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree and we mow and compact the soil under our, our trees so that it's rock hard and nothing can, can uh, tunnel down into that. And this is the way we landscape across the entire country. I'm convinced that the way we treat the underneath our trees, even if they are the right species, is one of the major causes of insect declines. And of course, the cement landscape is not the answer either. This is what most people do. You've got a big tree in a yard. Uh, we're actually going to measure how well caterpillars do in a situation like this starting this summer, but I guarantee they're going to do better in a situation like this. We have a tree, uh, and then you have a layered landscape, maybe a dogwood or maybe an azalea, some ferns, ground cover. Soft landing. The caterpillars fall down. The ground is not compacted. Nobody's going to mow them. Nobody's going to step on them. Uh, there's plenty of leaf litter down there to spin their cocoon, much higher survivorship. 
This is where you can do your spring ephemeral gardening. This is how you shrink the lawn, folks. You put beds around your trees. The bigger, the better. Then you will have less lawn. Your trees will love it, and so will the caterpillars. Use your, your uh, native ground covers liberally, like uh, wild ginger, like may apple, like, like uh, uh, foam flower and ferns, all great, great uh, soft landing sites. Much higher survivorship for caterpillars. The fifth thing we need to do is, is be mindful of not creating ecological traps by building very attractive landscapes, particularly for birds, and then letting our cats outside so they eat those birds. Our birds are killing two to three billion birds per year in North America. So we've, we've already lost two to three billion. The cats are building another, getting another two to three billion. Um, we're really whittling away those, those birds. And I know your cat doesn't do this, but some cats are doing it, believe me. All you have to do is keep your cat inside. This is a harder one to, to deal with, and that is reflective windows. Window strikes are killing another billion birds every year. This is what a uh, window in my, the back of my house looks like. You can see how reflective they are. Um, serious, serious problem, but this is how we, we've solved it. Um, we went online, look, this, these are bungee cords. You just hang them from a, a piece of plastic there. Uh, and um, they do deflect uh, almost all of the, the bird uh, strikes. This is what it looks like from the inside. It's, uh, a, you know, it's a different aesthetic, but um, you get used to it and, and it really does work. Okay. Another grad student, Desiree Narango, um, did some wonderful work with chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, DC. And one of the results of her work is, uh, it looks like there is room for compromise in our plant choices, and that's good news to me. She asked one simple question, how well do yards that are landscaped primarily with native plants, dominated by native plants, how well do they sustain chickadee populations compared to landscapes dominated by introduced plants? Well, when they're dominated by introduced plants, they support 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, we reduce the amount of bird food by 75%. They're 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. So every yard has a, 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 a birdhouse up in it, a little, little uh, chickadee house. But the chickadees would come and they'd look around and say, well, there's not enough food here. We're not even going to try to breed. If they did try to breed, they laid 1.5 fewer eggs. Those clutches were 29% less likely to survive at all. Those nests produced 1.2 fewer fledglings. If they did survive, and it took them 1.5 days longer to do that. And if you put all that together into a population growth model as a function of the percentage of non-native woody plants measured by biomass from zero to 100%. And the reason we looked at, at woody plants is because that's where chickadees forage on woody plants. This is what you get. The dotted line is replacement rate. That's the rate at which the population has to make babies in order to replace the adults that die every year. If you reproduce at that rate, uh, you have a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, what's above the dotted line there, you've got a growing population, but if you make fewer babies than adults die, and look where that happens, where it's below the dotted line, when you've got a lot of non-native plants there, uh, then you have an unsustainable shrinking population. Now, right here is where those lines overlap. Uh, in a, uh, or intersect, I should say, in a very generous way, which suggests we can have up to 30% of the woody plant biomass in our yard, non-native, without destroying the local, local food web. Now, none of those plants can be invasives, no calorie pears, no barberries, no burning bushes, uh, because those things are ecological tumors. They just keep, keep growing. Uh, but the, a number of our, our, our uh, ornamentals are not invasive. And it's, this is the area of compromise that I am excited about. If my message was we can have no non-native plants at all, very few people would be listening because we love our non-native plants. Remember Dan Getman's picture here? There's a ginkgo. I don't know if you picked that up the first time, but he's building a native landscape, but he's got a ginkgo here. Why? Because his wife asked him to put a ginkgo in. So Dan's a nice guy. He put it in. Is the ginkgo ruining the effectiveness of this landscape? No. Is it going to spread? No. It's one of those statues. It's just standing there, but it's not dominating it at all. So it's, it's not the presence 
of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It's not the presence of those non-contributors. It's the absence of the native plants, of the serious, serious contributors that is destroying our food webs. So if we increase the number of native plants, those keystone species, we can tolerate some non-natives. Can we use uh, uh, native plants in formal designs? Of course we can. This is a Lynn O'Shaughnessy design taken by a drone 400 feet up. It's a big garden. Every plant in that garden is a native plant and you don't get more formal than that. Our native plants are used in, in uh, formal gardens in Europe every day. And I guess that's okay because they're non-native plants over there. Can we get a pollinator garden into a, a typical uh, suburban yard like this without offending anybody? Of course we can, put a little fence around it. It formalizes it. It tells people that you're doing this on purpose. It's not just a bunch of weeds you forgot to mow. It's beautiful when it's in bloom. It's meeting the needs of a number of species of bees. It's not very big, could be bigger, but if everybody did it, um, we, wouldn't have, we would have fewer pollinator problems. And remember why we need pollinators. It's not what you heard. It's not because they pollinate a third of our crops. It's, that's really about a 12th of our crops that they're pollinating. It's because they're pollinating the plants that run the, run the world. 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants depend on pollinators. If we lost our pollinators, we'd lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet and that is not an option. So where do we need pollinators? Every place we need plants, which is every place. How about this, uh, a Drew Latham design? Uh, much bigger. Imagine the amount of life supported here versus the amount of life supported here. Seems like a no-brainer. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Of course they can. And Minnesota is, is doing a great job. It's kicked it off a number of years ago, actually, with the Lawn to Legume program. It's a cost-sharing program uh, where the state pays homeowners to reduce some or all of their lawn and replace it with appropriate Minnesota prairie plants. It's a very popular program. Florida has a, uh, there's an island of Florida that's paying people to um, allow burrowing owls, a listed species, to burrow in the front yard. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written with carrots rather than sticks. If you have an endangered species on your property, we're going to pay you to take care of it, to be a good steward of it, rather than fine you if you use your property. Everybody would want an endangered species. Put a bounty on your, your uh, invasive plants. Missouri's done that. Uh, St. Louis, Missouri, Fayetteville, Arkansas. South Carolina has banned calorie pear altogether. North Carolina has a, ban, a bounty on them. If you take out a calorie pear, you get a free tree replacement. Uh, even public utilities are giving people $100 coupons to put in water efficient uh, native species, particularly in the, in the Southwest, rather than thirsty uh, uh, non-natives. And of course, the, the lawn reduction programs in California, this has gone up. You get $3 per square foot rebate now by replacing lawn with appropriate xeric planting. It's a very popular program. And if you want more information on those, those various programs, memorize that. There you go. Okay. Uh, you know, I think we've made three missteps in the early years of conservation. And the first one's a serious one. We've started to think about nature as if it's optional. It doesn't mean we don't like it. We like to visit it. We like to watch it on television, but it's not essential. And if it's not essential, when push comes to shove, when resources are in short supply, nature takes a back seat. And that's, that's always, resources are always in short supply. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out. And there's this wall-sized poster there, which to me epitomizes our society's view of, of conservation. We wanna save nature, save wildlife for future generations to enjoy. That was Teddy Roosevelt's argument for creating the national park system. We wanna save these beautiful places so future generations can enjoy them. And I understand that, but it, it reinforces the idea that nature is there just for our entertainment. It is far more than that. We need to save nature so that we have future generations. It's a little bit more urgent. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. Uh, now, we talked about this, but if we restrict conservation just to the areas where there's not a lot of humans, we're gonna fail because those areas are too small, too few, too isolated. 
David Quammen has a, a great analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. This is a functional Persian rug. That's not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And that's what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I hate that language because it suggests there's, there's places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including our corporate landscapes, including our, our roadsides, including our agriculture. So we need to put the plants back. We need to glue our rug back together again, not just to create biological carters that allow that, that allow plants and animals to move back and forth between viable habitats, but to create viable habitats where we've destroyed them, where we live, where we work, where we farm, where we shop, all of those places by putting the plants back. And when we do this, and we're doing it, it's gonna be the first time in modern history that uh, we're gonna coexist with nature. This is a visualization, a visualization of what homegrown national park is going to look like. The third thing we need to do is, is uh, we've gotta rethink earth stewardship. In the past, we've, we've uh, We've designated to just a few specialists, you know, a few conservation biologists, a, a few uh, ecologists. For some reason, we didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of every human being on the planet. But I don't know why, because every human being on the planet, every single person depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystems. So why wouldn't everybody have the responsibility of taking care of those ecosystems? Stan Rushworth, the Cherokee elder once said, the Western settler mindset was, I have rights. The mindset of, Indigenous people is I have obligations. You're not born with those mindsets, you're taught them. We're good at teaching this one. We have been terrible at teaching our kids and our peers that we all have obligations to good earth stewardship. That doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. You know, right now, so many people feel absolutely powerless. The earth's problems are huge. What can one person do? Well, one person can shrink the lawn, one person can turn out their lights, one person can put in a pollinator garden, one person can remove the, the invasive species that are already on your property. Um, one person can, what else did we talk about? Fire mosquito, Joe. One person can do all of those things and totally revitalize the, the, the tiny ecosystem in their yard and enhance their local ecosystem. It also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't worry about the entire planet's problems. You get depressed. Just worry about the piece of the planet that you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you focus. If you don't own property, help somebody does. Help a, a land conservancy or, or a park or preserve. They're all underfunded. They're all understaffed. They will love you as a volunteer. So as a property owner or a volunteer, each one of us has the power and we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is gonna determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own fate. I think I have convinced my grandchildren that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Talami. That was a very empowering talk. <laughs> and, um, and I love all the practical, practical advice too. So thank you. Um, and we do have some questions. So um, one question is, when the insect apocalypse headlines were first coming out in 2018, I recall there, were, there was concern in the US that we really didn't have enough data available to determine just how serious the situation is. Mm -hmm. Has there been additional money put towards studying insect decline here? Uh, you know, there is an NSF um, panel which has been constructed and it, the first review of grants is happening as we speak. As a matter of fact, I'm supposed to review one. It's due May 16th. So the money that will come to actually studying this seriously is just starting to be released. There have been several studies since then globally, some review papers. Um, you know, I, I think the answer is it's insects are not declining every single place for no reason at all, but they're declining in an awful lot of places. As Dave Wagner says, you cannot add 8 billion people to the planet without things suffering and insects are, are certainly one of them. Um, so uh, it's not that they're not declining. We want to know what the impacts of industrial agriculture are 
light pollution, misuse of, of, of uh, pesticides, like, uh, like neonicotinoids. Most people don't realize neonicotinoids, which are a seed coating on just about everything we plant, are 7,000 times more toxic to, to insects and birds than DDT was. And we use them everywhere. Not Europe, they're banned in Europe, but uh, the EPA is getting ready to renew the, their, their licensing for another 18 years here. So, um, so we know what's going on, uh, but you know, there's a study, I, I worked on horse flies and deer flies in a lake in North Jersey that really hasn't changed. I did that in, in 1976. I would love to go back there and do the same study. There were 54 species there. I know exactly how many I got over two years. And that would tell me whether in this place that hasn't changed, there's no agriculture around there, do we have insect declines? Mm -hmm. If we do, that would point seriously towards climate change. And climate change is certainly impacting them in the, in the West where you've got a 13,000 year mega drought where you kill the plants, of course you're killing the insects. But in the East, you know, where we're not doing these other things, are they declining? Maybe not. Hmm. So, yes, we need those kinds of studies. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so roughly how many years will it take for our native insects to adapt to invasive plants such as calorie pears? Okay, good question. Uh, you can, you can, all we can do is look at, at the data we have so far. Mm -hmm. So let's look at, at Phragmites, the common reed, which we know when it was introduced about 400 years ago, it was packing in, sh in ships. Uh, it came from Europe where it supports, uh, what is it, 175 species of insects, something like that. Mm -hmm. It has been here for 400 years and it now supports four or eight. I got to get my stats right, but just a handful, just a handful. And they didn't adapt. They already were able to use it because they're grass specialists that had the adaptations to that particular lineage of grass. So how long does it take? It does happen, adaptation happens, but it is far slower than people think. It takes, it takes thousands of years. Melaleuca in Florida, uh, you know, it's been there over 120 years. In Australia, it supports 408 species of insects. In Florida, it's it's now around eight. I think that's the, the statistic. So um, yeah, very, very slowly. Not, not fast enough to save the day. Let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So how is the Homegrown National Park map currently looking? And are there any areas of the country that are particularly active? Okay, good question. Um, we have over 14,000 people who are on the map. You know, we've realized that uh, our ambitions are, are too modest. We talk about shrinking the lawn and creating 20 million acres. And we really, we really want to conserve all the privately owned property, which is 78% of the country. So 20 million acres is like 1.5% of what we need to conserve. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we want to expand that a little bit to woodlots, uh, there, there are, I don't know how many millions of acres of woodlots are owned in just in Pennsylvania alone by private citizens, not by logging companies. We want to include all of them. We want to bring agriculture into it. There's a number of things that, that uh, for example, that uh, 770 million acres of rangeland that they can do if they restore the riparian carters on their rangeland, they have restored the ecological integrity of much of that, that land because that's, that's what everything depends on, the water that's moving through those those streams. So if you keep the cows out of the streams, you really can revitalize, uh, you know, many of those areas. Uh, so we're, we're expanding it to that. Um, we need to grow. We need to grow a lot to, to really accomplish our goal. What we're really trying to do, though, it's not just getting acres. We're trying to change the culture by getting this message to as many people as possible. And in that sense, I think we're, we're, we are seeing more success because a lot of people are talking about it, realizing that they can do something about these serious problems. They see these, these headlines, they get upset, and they really do think, oh, there's nothing I can do about it. I'll just jump off the earth. There is something you can do about it, but it's a, it's a, it's a grassroots solution to a global problem. We're not going to solve this with, with top-down regulation. That can help, but people hate that. We're going to solve it by changing the culture, realizing that everybody needs to learn to live with nature. We can do that. 
mm-hmm. can do that. And it is, it is happening. And that's the real goal of, of Homegrown National Park. To get the guy with the big lawn who kills everything to be the social pariah instead of the the uh, high status symbol. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So for you, are you working on a new book at this point? I know you just uh, <laughs> you just released. Yeah, uh, I got a couple in mind, but I've got to finish my email first. <laughs> that's a serious problem i just have no time to do these things but i am going on sabbatical next spring and i'll work on a book then so okay okay um and can you tell us uh about the 20 dollar for 20 million acres oh well um yeah so homegrown national park uh is free but it's it's a you know it's a 501c3 it's a it's a uh, nonprofit that doesn't run on zero so we have mm-hmm. to try to raise money and that's what that that was it was a, an effort to you know try to try to put some money in the bank the map itself we hired professional you know coders to to do this they're very expensive and we're just living on contributions um we're not getting enough contributions so <laughs> You know, if you just made a couple of million, somebody just won that $410 million Powerball. If you want to make a contribution, there you go. (laughs) (laughs) It wasn't me. I did buy a ticket, but I didn't match a single number. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know what? I I see one more here. Um, Can you recommend plantings that will benefit caterpillars the most when located as ground cover understory below oaks? Blueberries. Blueberries. Well, you know, you have to rethink what a ground cover is. A ground cover is is something that covers the ground, and leaf litter is great at doing that. But planting through that is really good too. So blueberries like acidic soil, as do many of our oaks. Um, you can get low bush bush blueberry, and uh, if you want it really low, but otherwise, create that layered landscape under under your oaks. Don't put whatever you plant under the oak right next to the trunk. Your oak has a, has a big canopy that spreads out. So get it out near the edge so that it gets, gets some light. But um, blueberries are very high. Viburnums, things like Viburnum dentatum. Viburnum dentatum supports 103 species. Um, that would be, be very good. If you really want a ground cover, get your, your Virginia creeper under there because that that's, uh, you know, supports a lot as well. Um, remember there's a lot of species that actually eat leaf litter, dead leaves. There's 70 species of moths that depend on, on leaf litter. Mm -hmm. Uh, and some of the specialists on oaks, like the, uh, banded hair streak, their larvae eat dead, dead leaves on the ground. So allowing that leaf litter under the ground to remain on the ground under your oak is, that's actually a form of planting. You're helping a lot of living things by doing that. Mm -hmm. Well, again, um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, let's see, I think, um, I think there was one, this person says, our leaves are left in place per your recommendations. We have clay soil, any plantings that work best for that? Well, you know, clay typically represents bottom land. Mm-hmm. So the things that do well in bottomland would do fine in clay. Sycamores uh, okay. come to mind, or uh, you know there are if you're going to go with an oak, pin oak. That's where pin oak belongs, not on the street corner. It's it's the oh. oak of the swamp or swamp white oak or swamp chestnut oak. All of those do well and on clay soil. So mm-hmm. okay, all right. Well, I think that is it for the questions. Again, thank you so much for your time. And uh, you're welcome. welcome. Good luck, everybody. (laughs) Thanks. (laughs) Everyone, yeah, join uh, Love Your Alley and get planting.